The Book of Revelation for the World Today, a chapter-by-chapter study of what God has revealed about the future. Welcome to the Book of Revelation for the World Today. From the Bible, we will read Revelations 18, verses 20 to 24. It describes heaven rejoicing over the fall of Babylon. While grief is overtaking rulers and merchants because of the destruction of Babylon, we who will be in heaven, the Christians, which the rapture already happened, along with the apostles and prophets, will rejoice at the righteous judgment of God. After Babylon is destroyed, heaven will rejoice. The address is made to the saints and the apostles and the prophets. God has judged their judgment on them, bringing to Babylon the righteous judgment for having put to death many Christians or saints. Many had been persecuted and martyred at the hand of Babylon, so this is divine payback. God has gotten even, so to speak. Heaven is called to rejoice. The tribulation martyrs that we find in Revelation 16 rejoiced, not over the deaths of those doomed to eternal hell, but because God's righteousness and justice will have been applied. Verses 20 and 21 says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. These verses describe the collapse of the revived Roman Empire. The finality of its destruction is shown by the sixfold repetition of the phrase, No more at all. This is the reason why heaven will rejoice and never see, hear, or testify of such terrible evil ever again that would have come from Babylon or Rome. Our text gives us the results of the collapse of the Babylonian system. The saints in heaven are asked by God to rejoice over five things that will never happen again in Babylon. Today we will look at these five things that we will rejoice about. We will rejoice because there will be no more music in an unholy place, no more corrupt businesses, no more candlelights, no more sorceries, no more deaths of saints. First, no more music in unholy places. Verse 22 says, And the voice of harpers and minstrels and flute Players and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. The voices of harpers and musicians, pipers and trumpeters just added to the fanfare and public display of both the religious and political Babylon. Now they are silenced. Literally, everything grinds to a halt everywhere. Babylon will completely and so thoroughly be destroyed that it will never rise again. And the first things to go is music. Well, you know, people might use music to, to appease their guilt and drown out everything in their head. But there will be no more worldly music, no more parties where God is not welcomed. Generally, music and a good time go together, for the world in a way. Music is used in lots of different ways. But considering the overall description of Babylon... It probably was a party atmosphere or a self-absorbed context that this music was enjoyed. The emphasis no doubt included the nightlife, the self-life, the ballrooms, the dances, and the social gatherings, all with no thought for God. It was all about pleasure and having a good time. Heaven rejoices not only when the music stops, but also when corrupt business stops. The second thing we will rejoice about, there will be no more corrupt businesses. Verse 22 says, And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. 
the very tools that permitted them to have a life of luxury is over. Milling was necessary to produce flour and meal, which was a main staple of the ancient society life. The absence of milling means the absence of people. When bad news hits people, they panic, and they run to secure their future with something else. But there is something else to turn here. Another thing that falls under business is weddings. Verse 23 says, And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more in thee. Weddings were a byproduct of religious Babylon. Let me say it this way. Because of the Roman Catholic false teaching concerning marriage, it created a platform for financial gain. Listen to the teachings of, the, of Roman Catholicism concerning marriage. Remember, first of all, that political Babylon and ecclesiastical Babylon are in the same place. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome, but the Pope lives at the Vatican in the middle of Rome. And believe it or not, the Vatican is a country by itself. Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. The Catholic Church teaches that the sacraments are, and I quote, efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the Church by which divine life is dispensed. The visible rites by which the sacraments are celebrated signify and make presence the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. End of quote. That was found in the Catholic Catechism, lines 774 to 776. But they teach more than this. They teach that the sacraments are necessary for salvation. Catholicism teaches that sacraments are not merely a symbol but are believed to actually confer sanctifying grace upon the recipients. In the Greek New Testament, however, there is no word, nor even any suggestion, corresponding to the word sacrament, nor does the earliest history of Christianity give any trace of them to, ser to describe certain rites of the church. We, as Christians, fundamentalists, Bible-believing, we have ordinances, not sacraments. The Roman Catholic Church believes that all their seven sacraments were instituted by Christ himself. They believe they are means by which a person can be saved. They need the sacraments to be saved. While a sacrament is seen as a means of grace, an ordinance that Christians have that the Bible teaches is a practice that merely demonstrates the participants' faith. I don't think it is biblically correct to say that we have sacraments. No, we have ordinances. All that to say that since Catholics need the blessings of the Pope or Bishop in their marriage, they live in fear that they will not be saved if they don't have Rome's seal of approval to receive that grace. They become slaves to Catholicism. They get married there, along with all the expensive ceremonies, which has been a source of financial gain for the Catholic Church. That will no longer continue at the fall of Babylon. Now, the next thing that we rejoice about in heaven is the fact that there will be no more candlelights. You see, verse 23 says, And the light of a candle or lamp shall no more at all be in thee. In a Roman Catholic church, candles are placed before a statue of Jesus or of the Virgin Mary or of a saint using votive candles. A votive candle signifies literally that the lighting is done in fulfillment of a vow, although in most cases the intention is merely to give honor and devotion to the saint before whose images the candle is lighted. In almost any Catholic church you walk in, there will be a small corner or wall filled with rows of candles. It seems like a solemn place, but it takes money to light a candle in memory of a loved ones with the intention to pray for the deceased. In the lighting of the candles are not only prayers, but the prayers become similar symbols of one's action. In burning candles, prayers 
uh, rise up to heaven, according to Catholicism. They rise up to heaven day and night uh, for the, by the prayers of the saints, intercession. Saints in the Roman Catholic Church, you see, are those that have been chosen by the Pope and declared saint. In other words, they're worthy of prayer to intercede on behalf of a Catholic. Now, the Bible teaches that a saint is anyone that has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior in their life. It's a Christian. No one, and I repeat, no one ever gains a position worthy to be prayed to or kneel to or have a better way of relaying prayer to the Master. Only Jesus has that right. They never become mediators between God and man. The Bible clearly teaches this in 1 Timothy 2.5, which says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. The lighting of candles has been observed since the early time of the Catholic Church. Churches mostly disguise the cost as a donation but there is a price tag placed on prayer. Some churches even go as far as to charge $350 a year to light a memorial candle uh, so it burns all year. This demands that people follow rituals in order to be accepted in that religion. People pray for the lighting of the candles in that church for fear of being rejected by God. Another subject of praise in heaven because of Babylon or Rome's fall, will be there will be no more sorceries. Verse 23 says, And the light of the lamp shall, shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Our text tells us that it was by sorceries that all nations were deceived. By sorcery, we mean the use of magic, especially black magic. White magic is supposedly used only for good or unselfish purposes. And black magic, we are told, is used only for selfish or evil reasons. Satanism draws no such dividing line. Magic is magic, and uh, uh, be it used to help or to hinder. Sorcery, the act of using spells or chatting to spirits, is deemed as an abomination in the Bible. Sorcery can be seen as an effort to circumvent God's knowledge and sovereignty and to worship Satan instead. Sorcery encompasses a number of activities that are forbidden in the Bible. It is defined as the use of evil, supernatural power over people. It is closely connected to witchcraft and the casting of spells. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 to 12, many of the practices associated with sorcery that are condemned are named for us. It says, There shall be not found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. While Catholics, Catholic priests are believed to have spiritual power, and you hear that said many times, over ghosts and demons, every Catholic priest has been ordained first as an exorcist and uses occult powers. James Howe, a Catholic layman, catechist, a graduate from a Catholic seminary, says, All priests are trained and capable of performing exorcisms. Those exorcisms are reserved to a bishop, 
although he usually delegates one particular priest in the diocese, diocese to be exorcist. Each diocese is required by Rome to have an exorcist. End of quote. It is rumored that the largest collection of occult works in the world is found at the Vatican Library. These are manuals to be used by Catholic priests and are, and there are, and there lies the reason for corruption. After God's judgment on Rome, there will be no more sorceries, and fifth, there will be no more deaths of saints. Verse 24 says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. If you want to notice the close liaison between that great city Babylon or Rome and the harlot, in Revelation 17, 6, it says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, that's uh, religious Babylon, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And in our text, referring to political Babylon, which is Rome, we have the same thing, verses 24. And he was found, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Religious Rome has slaughtered many times the number of both Christians and Jews that pagan Rome did. Beside these, those victims of the Inquisitions, there were Huguenots, Albigenses, Waldenses, and other Christians, massacred and tortured and burned at the stake by the hundreds of thousands simply because they refused to align themselves <clears throat> with the Roman Catholic Church. Listen to the leading 19th century Catholic professor of church history, J. H. Ignaz von Dollinger. Quote, the view of the church had been that every departure from the teaching of the church must be punished with death and the most cruel of deaths by fire. Both the initiation and carrying out of this must be ascribed to the popes alone who compelled bishops and priests to condemn heretics to torture, confiscation, and of their goods, imprisonment, and death and to enforce the execution of this sentence on the civil authorities under pain and threat of ex excommunication. The remnants of the chambers of horror remain in Europe to this day and may be visited. They stand as memorials to the zealous outworking of Roman Catholic dogmas and to church and to the church which claims to be infallible, but to this day justifies the such barbarisms. They are also memorials to the astonishing accuracy of John's vision in Revelation 17 and 18. These are the subjects of rejoicing in heaven, and God, because God will have stopped corruption once and for all. Till we rejoice in heaven one day, we are to rejoice every day here on earth. And we can thank God that he has opened our eyes and that we understand the very things we looked at today. Until he comes, we are to be faithful. We are to uh, be vigilant. So till next time, may God bless you and make you a blessing. Maranatha.